Has Jesus Christ risen from the grave? Is he alive forevermore? Are we alive? Why don't we stand up and just give him a great applause tonight? Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are he that liveth and was dead, and behold, you are alive forevermore. Hallelujah. ashamed of that name, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. Hallelujah. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Here we go. You ready? God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to Sure is this 
This child can face uncertainty because Christ lives. Amen. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow because He lives. All fear is gone because I know. so blessed that we have a reason for being alive. Isn't it amazing? Lord, thank you that we have somebody greater than ourselves. We have a cause greater than ourselves. That we have a purpose greater than ourselves, Lord. It's you. It's our risen, ascended, seated, interceding Christ. Lord, we worship you tonight, our Messiah precious Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become His righteousness. He humbled Himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing so amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer. Yes. 
Jesus, thank you that you've imparted that heavenly life to each one of us. We are of that second man now. We are heavenly people tonight. We are heavenly people. You have made us for heaven. You have made us for worship. You have made us, Lord Jesus Christ, for yourself. We are yours. We are yours, Lord. We do not belong to this world. We belong to heaven, Lord. We worship you. Have your way tonight in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. Pray with me. Father, just be with me at this time. Just pray with these words in the blood of your name we pray. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about missed opportunity. Missed opportunity. I want to start off. Can you guys hear me? I got a loud enough voice. Maybe you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Okay, we'll get that together. There we go. It's coming back, all right? I want to start off today with a story, all right? I rarely do, do this, so just follow along with me. But last year, or maybe sometime in the beginning of this year, I'm not sure, Pastor Love blessed me and my children with the opportunity to go to a New York Knicks basketball game. And if you know anything about me, I'm a big Derrick Rose fan. And Derrick Rose is a part of the New York Knicks. And so uh, we had the opportunity 
Sorry about that. So that. We had the opportunity to get pregame passes to where you got the opportunity to be in the arena before the, the stadium started to get filled up. And so we got to see players come out and warm up, shoot around. They was playing the Golden State Warriors. Some of you may be uh, familiar with Steph Curry and his team, Draymond Green and those guys. But me being a big Derrick Rose fan, I had tunnel vision. I said, the only person I want to see is Derrick Rose, right? So as they, these guys are waiting for Steph Curry to come out the locker room and warm up, I'm sitting there waiting on Derrick Rose to come out. And eventually, Derrick Rose come out, and I'm not going to lie to you, I became overly excited, all right? And I was just like a little kid in the candy store. I was like, oh, man, oh, my God, right? You know, like it's Derrick Rose. He comes out. We're in the second row by the goal, and he comes walking our way, and I'm thinking that he's going to stop where we are, and he goes to the other side of the court to where the media is. And as my children are sitting here, you know, don't think I'm a bad dad because of this, but I left my children. All right, so I got it. I got it. Yeah. But I want you to understand, I didn't want to miss this opportunity to be able to see if I could even shake this guy's hand. So I didn't want to miss that opportunity, so I seen everybody over there with their passes like this. So I walked over and got by the media, and what I did is I, I flipped mine around, right? But not only did I flip it around, I had my phone out as if I was media. And I'm just, I'm doing this, you know, he's stretching and getting himself prepared. And I say, hey, Derek, and he looks over. I say, hey, man, I, I love your game and I respect your game. And he says, he says, thanks, man. I say, hey, do you mind if I shake your hand? And he said, no, nah. he comes over to me. And he, you know, what we do is show the little bump. And I say, hey, man, I respect that. He said, hey, no problem, man. I say, listen, before the, you go into the locker room, can you sign my hat? You know, I bought this expensive hat for $30 and a basketball for my son. So I say, hey, can you sign my hat and my basketball before you go into the locker room? And he said, yeah. So he's doing his warm up. And I see the team about to come out, and they're like, you're a New York Knicks. And I'm like, oh, man, he forgot about me, right? And he runs over, and he signs my hat, and he signs the basketball. And he says, hey, 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 hey. I said, man, can we get a picture? He said, I got to get in the locker room. Then he comes back. He said, hurry up, hurry up. So we get a picture. I said, oh, man, that wasn't good. It's blurry. He said, is that good? I said, yeah, man. He said, get a picture. I said, is that good? He said, yeah, that looked like a good one. I said, yeah. He said, okay, man. He shook my hand. He ran off in the back. But see, I didn't want to miss that opportunity because I was in reach of him. And I didn't ever know if I would get another opportunity to be that close or in the same arena with him. So I had to take advantage of that. If you guys would turn with me to Luke 7, 37, which was exhibited in our, in our play this week, it just touched me about this sinful woman. It's going to be Luke 7, 37, and it reads... And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with her hair, the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. I said, wow, how could a guy like Simon, a Pharisee, invite Jesus over to his house for supper and miss the opportunity to wash his feet? How could those individuals that was invited to, the, to that dinner, no one took advantage of trying to wash his feet? But this lady, she got wind of it, and she said, I, I need to be there. I want to go back. You see how I was in the arena? I was in the arena. I had the opportunity. They had the opportunity and they did not take advantage of surrendering their life. So when this lady got wind of it, she ran over and started to wash his feet, surrendering her life with tears and drying his feet with her hair. I don't know if you would do that. Would you do that? And you ask yourself for real, are you going to drop down and start washing somebody's feet? But she did because... No one else there, and this is the point that I want you to understand, no one else there understood his value. No, no, let me say this again. No one understood the value of his presence. Because if you understood the value of his presence, everybody would have been surrendering their life to wash his feet. They would have dropped down and started doing exactly what she did. They would have started to surrender their life. And they would have seen him on a bigger platform. 
and they would have been able to understand and experience what the passage further goes on to say about the rest in that, in that passage. I don't have time to get into it. However, when you're within reach, when you are within reach and being in the presence of God, don't miss the opportunity to allow God to work in you. How do I get in that presence? If you ask worship, meditation, prayer, there's all types of ways that you can get in front of God and allow God to work in you. But you don't want to miss the opportunity. See, I was there and I never knew if i will be there again. And they never know if they'll be there again, but they didn't seize the moment. They didn't take advantage of what was presented to them. So I say to you that Jesus dying on the cross was about love. We know that, right? 316, I want to experience that love. I want to be able to walk in that love. How do I do this? I have to have quiet time. I have to have moments that I can allow God to work into my life and become intimate with God and have that relationship with God. And the way that you do that is, is understanding that God is omnipresent. Is that correct? Is God omnipresent? God is everywhere, right? And it's okay for him to be omnipresent and be everywhere, but you have to be aware of his presence. See, that's the trick, because he's there, but you have to be aware of his presence. Would you agree with that? Amen. Thank you. Did he just drop the mic? Okay, he had an opportunity there. All right, it's amazing. Hey, Terry, come on up. So, uh, yeah, we just want to bring, uh, you know. You know, you see everyone the whole week long, and uh, really, but... Who pushes, I mean, who, uh, you give the orders, right? You gave the orders from up in the crows that she had never done that before. And, you know, we know that it went, you know, we would say, we would say seamlessly. We all know it didn't go seamlessly, but it, but we know, it, you know, it's amazing. Hey. Just say something. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. So I just want to say a couple things about the play. Um, as much as you loved it, we loved it. Um, it was very much a collaborative effort. Uh, everyone, I had a, some, Pastor Steve wrote it. I had some thoughts and ideas about it. And everyone in the cast pitched in. Everyone, if there was something I, I would ask opinions, I would say, what do you think? And I'm telling you, I got great ideas a lot of things. The whole thing where um, Dave would, uh, David asked his son, Nathan, father and son, if, uh, oh, there you are, if um, we should change it from the first time we did it was, let's make more cookies. But Pastor Mark suggested, why don't you have the little boy get saved? So that didn't even come from anyone in the play. That was completely another idea. It was a brilliant idea. So when we um, started this play, the goal was a streamlined visual gospel that the unsaved could come and see and hear. The whole thing was just about presenting the gospel to people. Um, and everyone in the cast bought in on that. They were fantastic. Everyone um, just participated with all my ideas. The sound crew, the band, Matt on the lights. You would not believe the things I asked people to do. <laughs> <laughs> and they did everything. Everything I asked them to do, they were fantastic. Uh, Jason Benoit was my right-hand man. I had him running all over the place doing stuff for me. I have no social media skills, and he would do the... I gave him a mess of papers and said, this is our rehearsal, and he took it all and put it online and made it, you know, legible. Um, and Paul Merriman met me at the door every, every time early, ready to do anything, I, you know, move everything. He was fantastic. So everyone participated uh, so greatly. And I have heard um, a lot of people tell me that they uh, 
brought unsaved people. They brought family members from afar. I invited my, one of the guys that worked on my house. He came with his whole family. It was like eight people. It was amazing. And I was so stunned to see him. I'm looking at him going, why are you here? <laughs> and then I realized I gave him a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was like I kept hearing stories over and over again. And I, I will tell you, I honestly, people would say to me, we're praying, we're praying. I believe that is the answer. That was what made the play um, go. It didn't go seamlessly, but it did go very well. And that's what it, that's what it was. It was the prayers of the, the saints holding us up. The prayers of the cast, we prayed for unsaved people to be in those seats. We prayed for the prodigals to come and watch and come back. And we prayed for people just to be renewed in their hearts. So I thank you all very much. It is, it is truly a body effort and you guys are all part of it. So thank you. Yeah, so if you were a part of this in any way and you're here, just would you stand anything that you did in the play? Just stand up. Let's just see how much of the body put into this. There you go. Look at that. Any part of it, yeah. Yeah, so that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Terry, yeah, it was great. Here's some numbers, and numbers are important, as we heard, because uh, how, how do we know numbers are important? What was it? John 21, right? How many fish were on the beach? Do you know? 153, not 151, not 155, 153, you know? Almost as much as won the Florida election in 2000. No, I'm sorry. Did I just descend into politics? Oh, oh forgive me. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Okay, but here's some numbers for you. Okay, so um, during the course of the four nights, now we know that some people came again and again and again and again, but uh, the total number of people coming in, if you went to the Orioles game every day, they still count you every time you go. So uh, if you came to the play, the, the total number of attendance here was about 2,600 people. So uh, yeah, on both uh, Thursday night and Friday night, there were more than 700 people here. And yesterday, for a matinee, the first matinee we've done, I think, ever, we had almost uh, 650 people here. So that's good, you know, that's amazing. And documented, we have uh, 90, they're documenting 90 first-time uh, professions of faith. You know, that's what they got people on the card. So that's, you know. We just uh, really believe God for one soul is worth more than all the world, and uh, what happened there is amazing. So, uh, yeah. Uh, some people are asking about the paintings. Uh, the man who played Pontius Pilate is the man who painted those. That would be Matt Clark. So just so you know, uh, he did that with his, uh, <laughs> I think he did it with his hands. You could talk to him about it, but I think that's, that is a, a very elegant finger paint and throwing things at the canvas and having it, you know, I had an idea, I had an idea uh, about a missionary painting paintings that didn't work out, so Matt did it for me, and he's the missionary too, he's a missionary to Dundalk and uh, other places, so that's amazing, so he painted those paintings, and um, uh, that's, you know, just thinking about the numbers of what about numbers, this is a good segue to what? Offering, thank you. Wow, man, it's so awesome. You understand, yeah. You understand, numbers are important, offerings are important. Yes, every dime and dollar that you put in does something uh, to move forward the mission of Greater Grace Church. So we'll pray, let's just pause for a moment, just think about what God would have us to give tonight. He has a number in the Bible, a tithe, that's a tenth. That's something you can uh, deal with him about. He had mentioned it several times in the Bible. That's a, a little bit of obedience, a little bit of a structure for us. Uh, also, offerings above and beyond your tithe, uh, whatever God is leading you to give tonight. Uh, just listen to the Spirit, please, uh, for your own sake, not for the sake of greater grace in our offering, but for your own sake. Listen to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead you in this time in our service. So Lord, we do thank you. We thank you for Terry and everyone who participated, everyone who uh, helped with what we did all of this week. It's really been just an amazing Easter week. Everything that happened this week uh, was for your glory. The services this morning, uh, really, uh, just uh, really full houses and amazing uh, thoughts from God. And we just thank you, Lord, uh, for being in our church, being in our midst, and just really moving and leading us in all that we do. 
uh, to serve you and win people to you. You do that, Holy Spirit. You win people to yourself and to the message of the gospel. But we're thankful that you use us as your vessels. So we pray for this time, this offering, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. on his head, spear in his side. It was a heartache that made him cry. He gave his life so you would understand. Is there any way you could say no to this man? If Christ himself were standing full of glory and eyes full of tears and he held out his arms with his nail pierced hands is there any way you could say no to this man how could you look in his tear stained eyes knowing it's you he's thinking of Tell him you're not ready to give him your life. Could you say you don't think you need his love? Jesus is here with his arms open wide. You can see him with your heart. Do you stop looking with your eyes? He's left it up to you. He's done all he can. Is there any way he could say no to this man? How could you look in his tear-stained eyes? Knowing it's you he's thinking of. Could you tell him you're not ready to give him your life? Say you don't think you need his love. Thorns on his head, your life in his hands. Is there any way you could say no to this man? Is there any way? Is there any way? Oh, is there any way? could say no to this man. Okay, would you stand, please? Um, uh, let's see, where is he? Pastor Niazi, we got some visit. Pastor Niazi and his wife are here from Canada, somewhere right back there. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, also another, uh, Dan LaVenture, isn't he here somewhere from Finland, right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay, talk to each other for a couple of seconds. And we'll give you more instructions in a moment. <laughs>
Yes. Yes. Okay, here we go. Uh, Pastor Eugene, you want to come up? Uh, who else? Mark Linton, come on up. Anybody going with Pastor Shabelli tomorrow? Yeah. We're going. Okay. So we all have a prayer for pray pray for them. Pastor Fred's going. Uh, so these folks are going to Africa. Pastor Shabelli leaves uh, tomorrow. Good to have Pastor Carl here and the group from Wilmington. Thank you for coming. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yep. All right. Jesus, we pray for this group. As they, uh, Pastor Fred goes to India, the others are going to Africa, and our footsteps are ordered by you, and we trust you. Bring, give Pastor Shabelli good health, and those that are traveling, also Linda at home, give her good health, and, and we are trusting you in our work the anointing of your spirit on our time, our one-on-ones, our prayers for the sick, uh, for churches to be edified, pastors to be encouraged, and in some cases restored, and the body to be edified, and the humble and the meek people to have joy in their hearts, all, out, all throughout in Africa, wherever they go, and in India, and here in Baltimore. Thank you for this season that we are in just now, in, in the work of faith, and for the faithful people who are learning to walk by faith. And, and we ask you this in your name. Every airplane ride, every, every time we sit down, Every time we get up with everything that we do, all by your great grace and your love. And may we not miss a single soul in the tree like Zacchaeus, looking for something more. May we be led by you and guided by grace for every one of us in the room here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. We really, really covet the prayers, believe me. It's the prayers that put all these little things together and have somebody sitting right next to you that really is open to the gospel. Or maybe they're not, and it's just another opportunity to witness to somebody. So I think uh, the prayers of the saints, without its... Uh, who knows what happens with airplanes and what happens with connections and what happens with health and whatnot, you know. So uh, it's very encouraging to have these men coming with me, Mark Linson and then Pastor uh, Eugene, Pastor Ronaldo, who is already in Zambia, and Pastor Dwayne George. And uh, it's like we're, I called us, the, the, well, the four of us, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You know? It's like... I don't think we've been, we have done this in years, all, all together in uh, East Africa. And pray, we will be meeting with 100 churches in, in conferences in these um, few weeks, and also counting Zambia, where Pastor Ronaldo is now. And uh, we believe God, not that we're into numbers, but Pastor Steve said 153 fish. So um, I think we'll have at least 2,000 people coming, a thousand people at each convention, and it'll be exciting. Can you put Philippians 3.10 up there? It's my, my verse for the last couple of days. Is that possible? Maybe it isn't. I don't know. It is. Um, Father, we pray that you bless this time, and we thank you. We thank you for this church. We thank you for Pastor Schaller, his laid-down life. We thank you for the leadership of the church, the elders, the trustees, for every member in particular who has such value before God and is so important to this congregation, to this work of God, this work of God is across the street and around the world. And we thank you for that, God, that we can be in Baltimore on the streets evangelizing and then we could be sitting in some place in India 
and uh, just giving people the gospel. Bless Pastor Fred Special as he goes to India and the work there. In Jesus' name, amen. The first couple of words here, and remember the um, background of this is very important. Paul is in prison when he's writing this. We know a lot about his prison epistles, but sometimes I forget that, that he's in prison when he's writing this letter, and it's so edifying. It's so filled with joy. I think 17 times he uses the word joy or rejoice, be glad. And he's in prison, and, and, and in his prison experience, he's doing nothing but edifying. He's really like walking with God and fellowship with God. He's not thinking about, like, why am I here, God? Why, why can't I be out? I'm your apostle. I'm a pastor. I'm a church planter. What am I doing here? Well, you're here so you can write letters so that people 2,000 years later can be reading them. Hallelujah. God's, God's got an eternal purpose, so he's there. And he's just filled with joy. And he makes this statement in the beginning of this verse that I may know him. And really, isn't that what Christianity is all about? Hello? Are you with me tonight? That I may know him. And it's, a, it's in, a, in, in the infinitive tense, which means it, there's a purpose to knowing him, and it's progressive. That my knowing God, there's a purpose. Why? What the purpose for knowing God is to glorify him, get to know him, to grow as a believer, and uh, my purpose in knowing him. And this is so key, and I have an eternal purpose in knowing him. Just knowing God. This is vitally important in our, in our Christian lives. There can be times in my life when I think I know him. And then God sends a curveball that I miss with the baseball bat. And I realize I don't know him in this situation. That I may know him. Paul is saying this after 30 years. Uh, at what he's been through and what he's done and who he is. He wants to know God. Wouldn't that be great if all of Christianity had that kind of thought pattern? Hello? that I may know him. I pray that I don't lose that thought pattern. I pray that I don't lose that, that desire, that hunger to know God, to know him. And he can look at every situation that's happening in his life, every circumstance, every test, every trial, every problem, every relationship thing that goes maybe the wrong way, the right way, whatever it is. And in that, he can simply say, I'm going to get to know God. Amen? Amen. I'm going to get to know God. And this is so important. Working in Africa since 1986, we've seen so much when it's come to what you would call tragic things that have happened, whether it was a genocide in Rwanda, things that happened in Uganda and in different parts of West Africa and Southern Africa. And yet you meet believers, and rather than being people who concentrate on the things that happen, which can be devastating, They'll say many times, in most cases, I got to know Jesus Christ. I got to know God. It was, it was worth it when I look back at it. Maybe when I'm in the middle of it, I'm not thinking that way. Hello? Yeah, I'm not thinking that way. I'm going like, come on, this is, this is too much. This is enough. I've had enough, you know. But then I recognize what God is doing, that God is meeting me in my prison experience. Anybody here ever had a prison experience? I don't mean in jail. But I mean like the prisoner of the old sin nature, the prisoner of the world, the prisoner of the atmosphere and the enemies and everything that's out there. In one aspect, we are in a spirit, there's a prison. And yet we can get to know God in the midst of it. Some people are praying, oh, I'm praying for the rapture. And I pr thank God the rapture happens. I'm praying that things will change. I don't know, maybe nothing will ever change. Maybe it gets worse, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. But my whole desire would be to have a thought pattern that I would get to know him, to know him. I love this, that I may know him, that I may know him. And things happen. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, Paul talked about his calling and the things that he suffered. And he talked about being persuaded, being persuaded by God, being mentally won over to know him. And how key it is in his last letter, 4, 17 and 18 of 2 Timothy, talking about knowing God. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. I know. Do you know who you have believed? Yes. Hello? Yes. Of course you do. 
We know, say we know, know. whom we have believed. And we are persuaded that he is able. He's able to end it right there. He is able. I'm persuaded that God is able. God is able to help me to grow. God is able to make me more sensitive. I've learned a lot. I've been learning a lot about sensitivity and things like that. Like I'm still learning how to wash dishes. My wife says hot water soap, not cold water. When are you ever going to get it? <laughs> Since it could be a while from now. You know, I'm still young. Uh, why not? And, and just different things, you know. And we go through, but in getting to know God. And so we can look at problems and things that take place in our lives. And rather than look at them and get so controlled by them that we end up making decisions that take us out of what could be God's opportunity for me to know him. Hallelujah. That I might know him. And then he gives three ways, three kinds of definition about knowing God. The first one is, and the power of his what? Resurrection. Resurrection. Thank God that in this church, resurrection is a foundational great holy holiday. But it's more than that for us tomorrow. Amen? It's resurrection life tomorrow. It's meeting God tomorrow. The power of his resurrection. The power of the resurrection. I don't want to just know the resurrection as a holiday, holy day. But I want to know the power of his resurrection. This is God's ability to cause things to take place in my life. That I can be in a situation and I know the power. I have power to change. You have power to change. We have power to make a difference in this world. The power of his resurrection. I remember when we first started opening homes for uh, people that had drug addictions and alcohol problems and people in prison. And I, I thought, like people would say to me, like these people are not going to change. And I said, that's your attitude, and that's your perspective as an educator of some type, of some kind of a form of uh, change that takes place without God. I said, but do you understand the power of God's life? How the power of God's life can take a person who has a problem, an addiction, something that's going on in their life, and they can change? Hallelujah? Can change. It can take, it can, you know, some people have a problem with self-control, with anxiety, with fear, with doubt, with living in human reason. They got to have a reason about everything, you know? Interesting. And God says, I can deliver you from that through the power of a resurrection life. Am I right, Woody? You got it, right? The power of his resurrection. Through my own power, nothing can happen. But through the power of a risen Christ, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit changes them. How do you get sons of thunder to change? James and John, they were called sons of thunder. Violent tempers. They won't receive Jesus even after they met Christ. And they were born again, maybe. Had received Jesus Christ. Maybe they were on the path to that. Call down fire from heaven on this village in Samaria because they won't receive you. Kill everybody. That's really, that's, that's a great ministry. What's your ministry? Ministry of death? <laughs> ministry of just killing people? I've met people like that, by the way, even in the ministry. In some places, you know. They won't receive Christ. Let them go to hell. No, I'm going to just keep praying and believing and living and loving and hoping. Amen? The power. The power to change James and John. I mean, John is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. 1323, he says it, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. And he keeps saying that. He says it five times in the New Testament. And James, beheaded with a sword, preaching the gospel. Their lives were changed. Amen? Their lives were changed. Say, can my life change? Ask yourself that question. Say, Absolutely. By the power of God. Oh, you have you been through this whole time? Of, you ever try to change yourself? Nothing happens. Nothing happens. That's why I stopped playing basketball because I couldn't change my behavior on the court. I'm just joking, Pat. I just saw you there with your wife. <laughs> Believe me, that was that was some kind of a challenge playing sports with God's spirit. Hello? The power to change. 
Resurrection power. So we have something on this day to be thinking about that we can take in our lives and we can receive on a daily basis. I receive power from the Holy Spirit and from God, and God changes people. You know you've been changed, haven't you? Remember that song that Dr. Stevens used to sing? From glory to glory, he's changing me. Changing me. He's changing me from glory to glory. He's changing me. The love of God shown to the world. I forget the rest, but I love that song. He's doing the changing. He takes a murderer named Moses and makes him a writer of the Bible. He takes an adulterer and a murderer named David and makes him a writer of the Bible. God changes Moses. God changes David. God goes through the Bible. God takes Rahab the harlot. And changes her. God takes Ruth, the one from Moab, and changes her. Mary Magdalene, out of whom came seven devils, he changed her. The Mark 5 man, who had thousands of demons in him, became a preacher. To thousands. Imagine that. God changed them. God changed the woman at the well. God changed the Luke 7 woman. God changed blind Bartimaeus. God changed Rick, uh, Rich Zacchaeus, right? God changed. Two people are they're walking, and Jesus walks next to them, and, and they say, uh, what's going on? He overhears what they're saying, and they said to him, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? You don't know what's happened here? We thought it would have been he who delivered Israel. See, they just wanted the change in the national existence of their country. But God was there to change lives, Amen. He opened up their eyes at the breaking of the bread. And they were what? So changed they went back. They went back to Jerusalem. They were changed men. God changes people. Hallelujah. I don't care who you, who you got around you. What, what does your son, your daughter look like? Your brother, your uncle, the people that work with you. Hello? God does what? Changes people. How? By the power of resurrection life. You know, they got, they got prisons filled with people and they try to help them. And God, thank God, I'm not saying that some people aren't doing a good job. But you know what will change people? There would be, there'd be no need of any of those things if people were changed by God. And then those that didn't want to be, then there's the prison. But bring them the gospel, amen? I love the fact that where you go into prisons, you'll find people giving out Bibles and doing Bible studies and preaching and ministering to people behind bars. Changing people. Changing people. Can God change a marriage? Yes. <clears throat> yes. yes, he can. Yes, he can. My wife put up with me for so long. She was saved and I was dealing narcotics everywhere. I was high 24 hours a day for years. She kept praying. Her and my brother prayed, Pastor Shibley. They prayed. And something happened to me. God changed me. Amen. Programs couldn't do it. People couldn't do it. My own evaluation of my situation and through self couldn't do it. But God changed me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God changed me. God changed you. God changed you. How? By the power of resurrection life. And we can tap in and have a full opportunity to have that power in our lives on a daily basis. That I can go from being impatient to patient. Are you with me? From being angry to meek. From being a son of thunder to becoming a son of Jesus' love. It's hallelujah. Change. This is what this is all about. Jesus changed. He, he went into the grave. He was on the cross. He, he, he paid for our sins. He was a ransom and the rescue. I love that. The ransom and the rescue in that song. And then he rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And he was, he was different. He says, put your fingers in the holes in my hands. Put your hand in my side. And yet he could, as we heard today, he could pass through walls. Wow. And they changed. What happened to these 11 cowards? How did they change? They saw a risen Christ. Amen. He said, wow, what are we afraid of? He has power over death. The greatest fear that anybody could have in life is the fear of death, who all their lifetime have been held in bondage, Hebrews 2.15, right? He conquered death. What am I afraid of? 
Hello? What am I afraid of? Jesus conquered death, and I'm a Christian. And you have the Holy Spirit, and I have the Holy Spirit. There's nothing to fear. There's no fear in love, because perfect love does what? Cast fear out the door. Hallelujah. Really, no fear. It's amazing what, how fear can cripple people. You see people all the time, and, and whether they're in institutions, they need psychiatric help, or prisons, or whatever. They just, people live in fear. Some people won't come out of their house in cities. They won't even come out of their house. I met a woman like that. She'd never been out of the house in 10 years. I just look out the window. I ain't coming out. I said, why? She said, the atmosphere. I'm afraid. I thought, wow, what a bondage. The power of his resurrection life. We've got that power, the Holy Spirit living in us. Then we have the fellowship of his sufferings, or we could say the relationship to what Jesus Christ submitted to. We have this amazing relationship with God that can take us through what? You know what, by the way, you know what the word suffering is very much related to the word evil, being under evil? Kind of like in its root, in its root idea there. We have a relationship to what he did and what happened to him personally in his life. We have this relationship. It's amazing. And then we are, what, made conformable unto his death. We've been changed. Think about it. Power, relationship, change. Can you say that? Power, relationship, change. Don't forget that. Power from God himself and the Spirit relationship to who God is and the plan of God and his purpose, and change takes place. And that's incredible. That's great. I, I'm, I expect great things from God on this trip, okay? Not because of us, but because of God himself. What's going to take place? We had, I think, I think somebody told, we, we were figuring it out today. Don't ask me why. I like numbers like Pastor Steve, you know? I think, I think we had um, 20,000 people come to church in Africa today. 20,000 people came to church. I'm talking about um, 278 churches around Africa. I was just calling people and talking to them. You ought to see the phone bills. You don't want to see the phone bills. My wife sees the phone bills. But it was, it's amazing. God is doing something. God took this ministry and brought this ministry into all of the world right, into 80 countries with 768 churches. And God himself has done that. And people's lives are transformed. We don't want to, I don't want to be conformed to this world, do you? No. Romans 12, 1 through 3, and be not conformed to this world. That's suschematizo. Outwardly, I'm going to be like this world. I got to wear what they wear, say what they say, do what they do, live like they live. Nah. No. Be not conformed to this world. The word world means that which is alien from God. But be what? Transformed by what? The renewing of your mind that you might prove what's the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Thank you, you're transformed. Amen? Say it, I'm transformed. God changed me. I got the power of his resurrection. I can fellowship and have a relationship with his sufferings. I can, that wasn't loud enough. <laughs> I can be conformed. I can be conformed. Wow. It's amazing. Power, relationship, and change. This is what Easter is all about. Power of his resurrection, the fellowship or relationship to what he did and what his life is all about, and then being changed, being changed. And that's, thank God, that's going to be what? Continual. That just keeps happening. Amen? That happens on Easter Monday, doesn't it? How about Easter Tuesday? Easter Friday? Easter Saturday? It just keeps going, right? Because we live in resurrection life. You know what it says about, you know what it says about this in closing about the apostles and, and the early church? This is what they were called, I think, seven times in the book of Acts. They were witnesses of the resurrection. They were called witnesses of the resurrection. That means they had a personal, first-hand knowledge of the resurrection. They were witnesses of the resurrection. And boy, what a difference that makes. I want this to be much more than just a day that passes by, but I want this to be life. 
power and life and fellowship and change. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you today. Thank you for this life. Thank you, God, for the power of your resurrection life, the fellowship of your suffering, that relationship, what you did for us personally, and then being made conformable, changing us. Power, relationship, and change. Thank you so much, God. This is what it means to know you. Knowing him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and being made conformable to his death. And then Paul could say, I'm, going, I'm, I'm forgetting the things that are behind. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. We're going forward. From Easter Sunday, we're going forward. We press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling. We thank you, God. We thank you. Thank you that you've given us the person of the Holy Spirit. You've given us the Bible. You've given us the church. Thank you. You've given us a purpose. You've given us your glory. You've given us your faith. You've given us your love. You've given us your mercy. You've given us the finished work. Thank you so much. You've given us a gospel to bring into all the world. Thank you, God, for this ministry. Having received this ministry, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4.1, we faint not. We're not going to faint. We're not going to give in and give up. We faint not. We faint not in 2 Corinthians 4.1 and 4.15 and 16. We faint not. Not fainting. No matter what's going on, no matter what the body feels like, the personal, physical body, no, no fainting. Let's just keep going. We thank you. Bless our night tonight in Jesus' name. If you are here tonight and you've never received Christ or you're watching on the internet, Jesus, say Jesus. There's no other name given under heaven by which you must be saved. Jesus. Maybe you're watching in some foreign country somewhere. It's just controlled by another religion. Say Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Jesus. I believe you are God the Son. Jesus, I believe that you paid the penalty for my sins with your blood on the cross. Jesus, come into my life and save me. I want to be born of God, born of the Spirit, born again. That's your prayer online, anywhere in the world, here in the audience. Just put your hand up. Acknowledge it before God. Jesus. The name Jesus. No other name given. We thank you. Bless our night tonight. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Wow, what a beautiful message. What a beautiful message. Thank you, Lord, that we might know you. Lord, that we might know you.
We'll have a uh, rap session in here with uh, Pastor Shabelli, and I think Pastor Eugene, can you join him? Is that about, okay? They'll be in here. Uh, yeah, maybe he'll sing the rest of that song. From glory to glory, he's changing us. Okay, uh, just a couple of announcements to, to, before we dismiss. Tomorrow uh, is Easter Monday. Uh, which is a holiday for the campus until the evening. The evening there will be Bible college classes. Uh, there's a baptism coming up on the 23rd of this month. You can talk to people at the Welcome Center about that. And on Saturday morning, uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association will have a free life and witness course here in our chapel beginning at 9 o'clock. And uh, you can find out information about that at the Welcome Center as well. All right, so let's pray and uh, we'll be dismissed. Uh, thank you, Lord, for tonight, uh, for power, relationship, change. Yes, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you're changing us daily more and more into your image. Give us a great week. We thank you for the great week we've had. We thank you for a great resurrection day. Just bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>